1860, a debate was arranged between Thomas Huxley, commonly known as Darwin's Bulldog, and Bishop Samuel Wilberforce. The debate was on the theory of evolution. It was organised at Oxford University by the British Society for the Advancement of Science. It became known as the Great Debate. Others have used the same name, but this was the first. Arthur Wilder Smith studied at Oxford, and I think he's supremely qualified to comment on this debate. Wilberforce was asked to speak first, and he brought the argument from design, which, although evolutionists have tried to ridicule it, is one of the strongest arguments there is. Machines must have a creator. Uh, he said, for example, that his watch obviously presupposed a watchmaker because the metal of which the watch is made can't do the mathematics to get the wheels the right size and get the spring the right strength. And therefore, if you see gold and steel put together so nicely so they mathematically parallel the rotation of the earth around the sun and around itself, that that must be information that's put in from outside and wasn't on the metal, although the metal can hold it. And he produced what we used to call Paley's, P-A-L-E-Y, Paley's natural um, theology. Huxley surprised everybody by introducing six immortal apes chained to six typewriters, which could never wear out. Let's see why. Now, said Huxley, you let those apes chained to the typewriter, six and six, you let them type. You let them type at random till eternity is almost past. Well, that'd be a very long time, wouldn't it? He said, yes, that's what we want, it's almost eternity. I like eternity if I could, but he said, I can't argue with eternity because we don't have it, but we have almost eternity. Now, before time quite ran out, almost at the end of it, we look at what they've typed. Okay? Said the bishop, and what have they typed? Well, he said, I look through millions and millions of papers, and I find one paper with, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. Well, the bishop almost went purple when he heard that. He said, you mustn't say things like that. But he said, I must. You're a professor of mathematics. Don't you know the probability formula, Bishop? Well, now, professor of mathematics. Couldn't very well say he didn't know the probability formula, could you? I mean, that wouldn't do. So he said, of course I know the, uh, the probability formula. But he said, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Well, the bishop said, of course I believe it. Well, he said, don't you see that where t, which is time, equals infinity, p, which is probability, equals 1. That is, if you give a lot of time enough for a reaction that's going on, typing, then you will, with certainty, get anything and everything out. You just let it go long enough, and you'll get out the 23rd Psalm. But the bishop said, the 23rd Psalm was written by David. And here you're saying it wasn't written by David. Oh, no, I'm not, said Huxley. What I'm telling you is that chance can do anything that you can do if you give it time enough. That's the nature of the probability formula. The Earth now is very many billions of years old. And the reactions that make you have been going on all this time. If you give time enough, just as your Carl Sagan says, life will arise. Therefore, they've been listening, and they've been looking. They sent labs to Mars and to Venus to have a look and see how life was coming along. <laughs> that was just it. I had Irwin in my house with his children recently, and I asked him about it. And he said, yes, we were told to look for this rock and that rock, and then it would be examined for chemical evolution, which was starting. And they never found one chance in five million that there was any sign of chemical evolution at all. Well, Huxley said, so you do see, Bishop, that uh, if you have time enough, all the works of God, including yourself, will be produced. Because where T equals infinity, 
P, probability, equals 1. Do you understand me, Bishop? Well, poor professor of mathematics. I had to understand him. So it's only a question of time. And you can do the works of God without God. David's works made by David were just as well made by chance if you give time enough. So you see, all you've got to do is have a very old earth, a very old solar system. And if you touch that question, you know, this is, this is the nitty gritty of it. This is the neuralgic point. If you touch the age of the earth and take away the infinite time, you've torn it. You've just about done it, because it all depends on that. That's where you've got to be careful about it, you understand me? That's where it turns. Well, the poor old bishop, he was absolutely upset by that. Because you don't really seriously mean that a man like me could have risen by chance. Yes, he said, I believe my mathematics, and obviously you don't. So the bishop said, look, we can't accept that. Because we could say that all the things we have in our civilization were made by chance. Exactly that, said Huxley. That's exactly what I'm telling you. I've quite often had to face this story of apes and typewriters. I've always dealt with it this way. A typewriter like this has 47 keys. The probability of hitting the right key to start the first line of Psalm 23 is 1 divided by 47. The probability of hitting the right key for the second character is also 1 divided by 47, and so on for every character. There are 40 characters in the first line, so the probability of an ape getting the first line typed is 1 over 47 to the power 40, which is 1.3 times 10 to the power minus 67, which, if you write it out longhand, is 0 0.660013. Multiplying by 6 for the 6 apes increases the probability to 7.8 times 10 to the minus 67, which is still, as near as makes no difference, zero. Zero probability means it will never happen. Huxley talked of probability equal to 1, which means it will certainly happen. He said that needs infinite time. But how long would they have to type to get somewhere near an even chance for any of the apes getting the first line right? Well, if you go through the maths and assume each ape hits one key every second for ever and a day, you'll find it's a bit more than 2.6 million 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 times longer than the astronomers say the universe has been in existence. And that's just to get the first line. I thought that was a pretty good answer to Huxley's story, but I found that many evolutionists are not swayed by utterly ludicrous improbability. They stick their head in the sand and say the probability is not quite zero, so it's not impossible. Professor Wilder Smith came up with a much better response, to which evolutionists can't give that answer. Now I'm going to tell you how it's done. Uh, you won't find it anywhere else, because until I wrote it out, in Man's Origin, Man's Destiny, and also in the Natural Sciences Know Nothing of Evolution. This was the picture. Since then, they've refused to take any paper from me because of that reason, for this very reason. Listen, that machine with its paper in it is a system, are you listening, which types but doesn't untype. It only types in but it doesn't type out. Now that's very remarkable, because nature isn't like that, you know. All the chemical reactions of which we're made, they type in, but they type out. Let me make it clear to you. You see, the body, the chemistry upon which you ride, and which you use to think and act with, the chemistry types in, and types out. It is totally and completely reversible. Proved by the fact that even to get the simplest form of life, you need enzymes which catalyze the coming to equilibrium of all the reactions of which you're made. So all these reactions are reversible. You take the simple ones of Fox and Miller, 
where he makes his amino acids, and then he says they will combine with one another to form proteins. They won't, unless you make them, which you do with the program. If you do that, then you can get on, and you can synthesize, and you could write the 23rd Psalm. But organic nature, it types in, and it types out, and there's one slight difficulty. It types out rather more quickly than it types in, due to the second law of thermodynamics. So you certainly will never, 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 get out by Darwinian processes, which Darwin suggested, you will never get a synthesis done. The only way to get a synthesis to produce nature, to produce the 23rd Psalm, is to introduce a means by which you can stop the typing out and force and encourage the typing in. Now that means, I can't go into it now because I haven't time, that means that you've got to have programming to say, hi, you can go in, but you can't come out again. Now programming means that you put in a surprise effect. The surprise effect is this, that normally you'd expect it to go in, if you know your chemistry, the typing, and you'd expect it to come equally quickly out. You'd type in and type out. That's what we normally expect. And in order to stop that, that's the law of nature. In order to stop that, you've got to program the machine with your genes and say, hey, in, but there you stay, and you don't come out again. And that's not a law of nature. That's a law of programming. And programming is the function of the genetic code. And the genetic code does not, being full of information or surprise effects, ever arise alone. Now, you see what Huxley had done and how he'd swindled, it's what we call sleight of hand. Nobody guessed that the typewriters that he'd used were really, are you listening? They were really creation machines. They allowed you to go in, and they didn't allow you to go out, because they're machines. But nature, without right typewriters, organic nature, organic chemical reactions, are not like that. They allow you to go in, slightly less easily than they allow you to go out. And therefore you can't synthesize with them. The only way to do it is to get a program put in, either from the head of a biochemist, or from the program of the uh, genetic code, which will then do it. So if you had a machine, a typewriter, which is really like nature, which Huxley was using, his probability formula will only work where it's irreversible. It won't work where it's reversible. Now, Prigogin, two years ago, got the Nobel Prize for seeing that. I've written it in my Man's Origin, Man's Destiny about 12 years before. But you see, the important thing is, no, 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 I, I, I don't mean that at all. Uh, I don't mean that at all. It's so simple uh, when you make it clear, such as I've tried to do tonight, that any school child can see it. But if you wrap it up in very complicated formulae, they won't, and they think it's a new invention. It's as old as the hills. That we remove, we remove the equilibrium, and you put your system far away from equilibrium, as Prigogin says, then your reaction will go forward. That's what he said, and that's the case. But he uses it to say that there's no necessity for a creation. If you just take it away from equilibrium, we don't need a creator. It will happen then, but he's forgotten to say that only a program will do that. And that's an answer so powerful that the establishment stopped publishing his research papers. It destroys their sacred theory of evolution. He was therefore no longer worthy to be considered a scientist. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.